Chapter 2 The Socratic Method Described The Socratic Method is founded on the proposition X that intelligence can be developed by mental exercise. The Socratic Institute is an organization by which the method can be made practicable and available to any adult person whose desire to be more intelligent is strong enough to lead him to do mental work. The institute provides opportunity and guidance at small expense and suited to the convenience of the patron. Any mind that feels a stimulation to activity when confronted by a question or problem in the field of its personal interest, and which strives to reach a satisfactory answer, solution or explanation will derive permanent benefit from this method. The immediate effect of the mental exercise prescribed by this method should be a quickening of the mental faculties. Logical perception, imagination, comprehension, much the same feeling of exhilaration that one gets physically from muscular exercise or games. The permanent effect should be a more efficient intelligence, better judgment, larger mental resourcefulness, a greater capacity to make plans, to lay out courses of action, together with more wisdom in deciding which plans to carry through. The method consists of a presentation to the mind of a question, a statement, a problem, a picture or cartoon, or any other form expressing an idea. The patron will register a definite response under the stimulus of the idea presented. The process of examining this response, of bringing to light the accumulation of ideas associated with this topic, of comparing them together, of revealing inconsistencies, errors and inadequacies, of examining prejudices, beliefs, theories which may be found capable of improvement when critically brought into relation with other ideas all of these mental activities set in motion by the questions and problems are calculated to accomplish the purpose, I, E, to increase intellectual power and efficiency immediately and permanently to develop intelligence. The material contained in this series of guidebooks is designed to set in motion these activities, provided the suggestions are followed. The material consists of themes which are built up out of ideas. A single word or phrase, I, E, jobs, labor-saving machinery, etc. Themes are organized into sections and courses I, A, industrial, relations, Christianity, etc. on the basis of logical relationship and sequence, so that the patron is led on from simple, familiar ideas to themes of increasing complexity and difficulty build up from the simple ideas. Courses are subdivisions of subjects I, E, economics, religion, etc., which in turn are combined into departments I, E, social science, art, etc. Let us examine one of these themes, selected at random from the course Industrial Relations, which is a part of the subject of economics. Jobs Industrial Relations too. What is a job? They. What has the worker to do with the creation of jobs? What are the conditions necessary before jobs can be created? How did the workers exist before there were any jobs? The index number in the right-hand corner indicates that this is the second theme in the course and therefore closely related in thought to themes near to it in the series. The parenthetical index number indicates that it is also a theme in another course, where it appears in a different relationship. As the patron reflects on question, what is a job? Ideas will arise in his mind. Wages, work, livelihood, employment, boss, etc. He will begin to formulate responses. A means of earning money, a measured amount of work to be done, an opportunity to work, etc. At this point he is ready to begin the real mental exercise. He must try to hold all these ideas in his mind at once and find an expression which will include them all. He will analyze the words, means, money, earning, work, opportunity, etc. Some of them may be the names of themes he has already worked on and he will refer back to the responses he has written to them. Presently it will occur to him to ask whether a job is a thing or what. It is obviously an idea corresponding to something existing in the external world. It is not a material thing. Yet it can be bought and sold. He discovers that he has ideas corresponding not only to things but to relationships. There can be no job without an employer and employee. Two or more persons are involved. Hence a job is a social phenomenon. From that point his mind proceeds to various forms of social relations until he hits upon the idea of contract. When he conceives a thought of a job being a contractual relationship in which work and income are involved, he will feel the satisfaction of having acquired new power. When this work has been done, the patron ought to be conscious of a pleasant state of mental stimulation, a little more inclination and ability to think through whatever subject is presented to his mind, whenever. In the future, he is confronted with a situation or problem involving the idea of jobs. He will be a little surer of his judgment and intelligence in dealing with it. When he has worked through a similar exercise with the themes closely related to industrial relations 10. Income. 
opportunity to work, enterprise, contract, etc. He will begin to feel at home in the field of industrial relations and economics. It may be that the patron finds his mind fails to function as we have just described. He may be unable to generate enough energy to conceive ideas, to analyze and combine them as we have done in the illustration. Even when he reflects on all the questions and of the theme, other devices must be employed. Mental activity is stimulated by criticism, argument, conflict of ideas, emulation. This requires contact of one mind with another. Let the patron arrange with another patron or group for joint discussion of the themes, for comparison of written responses, for criticism and suggestions. The effect of joint effort may be found to be as superior to solitary activity as a game of handball with friends is superior to a half hour of dumbbell exercise alone in a gymnasium. Still better and more effective is the group discussion under the guidance of an expert guide. The institute will be prepared to furnish such guides whenever desired. At the time and place most convenient for the group, another device for stimulating interest and mental response is the problem. A typical example of this kind of material. Labor Saving Machinery Industrial Relations 42 Problem 1 Under the Hart Schaffner and Marx Industrial Relations Plan the Board of Arbitration was petitioned by management for permission to substitute automatic vest pressing machines for hand pressing, requiring fewer workers of very little skill or training, and to adjust the piece rate for pressing on the basis of relative skill and effort. What would be the union's attitude? What sort of decision would you? As arbitrator, render, see Hart Schaffner and Marx Labor Agreement. 1920, page 22. See also Industrial Relations 61. Industrial government, or a situation is presented which at once raises controversial questions and emotional reactions. Boycott Industrial Relations 140. Situation 1. Two men pace up and down in front of a bakery on Madison Street wearing this placard. This bakery unfair to organized labor. What is the significance of this phenomena? What can the proprietor do about it? Do you think it matters to him? You feel, when you see it. Do any impulse to patronize the bakery. Account for your feeling. Compare your answers with those you have already recorded on unionism. Industrial Relations 24 Or a statement which is likely to be provocative of Discussion Dangers of Church Industrial Relations 151 Interference It would be very short-sighted for the church to attempt to Christianize individual businessmen of success in so doing meant that it weakened the survival strength of them and of their business organization. The result would be the ultimate extinction of businessmen and enterprises susceptible to church influence and the substitution for them of men and enterprises operating according to the economic law of competition. Do you know of any cases where this tendency seems to be operating? In what particulars do you think a real Christian is handicapped in competition with rivals who recognize no restraint except economic laws? If Christian principles were applied in industry, what would be the effect upon jobs? Reconcile these answers with your responses to themes in religion, or a cartoon which conveys a definite proposition vividly presented. Enterprise. Well oh bite. What's so disgraceful about it? Since 9 out of 10 of our great industrial executives began as laborers, Clerks, farmers or office boys. And there are more $100,000 jobs than there are $100,000 men to fill there. And since it is the hope of every American family that their son may have the ability, why is it that chasing them is considered such a great political sport and vote redder? Do you find any ideas expressed in this cartoon which are likely to mislead and confuse clear economic thinking? What is the element of truth in this cartoon? Still another device is the rest or rating scale by which the patron may ascertain his intellectual position in a matter where wide difference of opinion prevails. The test practically forces him to bring his opinions to judgment. Business versus Religion Christian Economics Rating Scale for Christians How far and in what manner should the church attempt to influence men in their economic relations? Different points of view from extreme conservative to extreme radicalism. Choose the position which you would be willing to defend with the greatest conviction. The church should limit itself to the personal relation of the individual to God and not concern itself with social relations or ethics. The church is responsible for the consciences of its members. If the conscience of the individual functions efficiently, his conduct will be socially desirable, so that the church need have no direct responsibility therefore. The church has further responsibility beyond stimulating the conscience to guide the conduct of war. Conscience must be enlightened and educated so that men will recognize and perform social duties. The church should develop the social conscience in the individual but should not attempt to formulate moral judgments in specific cases. The church should provide moral leadership in society, on the ground that it is the duty of the church to strive to make righteousness prevail in all the relations of life. Righteousness under modern economic conditions is a matter of right collective thought and action. 
The individual conscience even though completely dominant and enlightened is inadequate to guide conduct. There is needed a collective social conscience to determine what social righteousness is and how it shall be attained. The church should insist upon the complete application of Christian principles throughout all social and economic arrangements, and strive to create a kingdom of heaven in which spiritual interests shall be paramount, and the will of God prevail over every individual selfish interest. The social and economic system should be changed so as to secure the maximum of opportunity for spiritual development with material prosperity as incidental and subordinate. The church should formulate moral judgments on specific matters, such as eight-hour day, collective bargaining, etc. The church should oppose the capitalistic system, with its private property and the productive resources and its wage system as contrary to the principles enunciated by Christ. Pacifism should replace war, conflict and competition. Self-will should abdicate as a governor of human conduct in favor of the will of God as interpreted by the collective state. The government of men should be a pure democracy and should govern all the relations of men. The quotation is employed. Not for its worth as an assertion based on the authority of the author's name and prestige but because it is the best statement of the idea or point of view to be found. The accompanying questions will quickly arouse the critical instinct of the patron and guard him against hasty and passive acceptance of an idea inharmonious with his real beliefs on the subject, as worked out in response to preceding questions. When the quotations are from notable books, as they frequently are, they may serve as introducers of the book and entice the patron to follow up an aroused interest or liking for the quotation by reading in the volume itself. This is infinitely better than an assignment or recommendation of a book as a task of reading in a study course. To require something as a task is a sure way to destroy the pleasure in the doing. A typical quotation follows. It not only presents an idea, rich in suggestion and application, a key to many problems in industrial relations, but is bound to create an appetite for more from the same dish. Management. Economics 50. Quotation 1. There is nothing like distance to disinfect dividends. Therefore the moral character of the stockholders makes very little difference in the conduct of the affairs of the corporation, Christian or heathen, native or alien, blue blood or plebeian, rich or poor. They all sanction much the same thing, and that is, the policy that promises the biggest dividends in the long run. To the directors their virtual mandate is get results. The directors pass this mandate to the officers. The officers pass it along to the heads of departments, and these send it down the line. Take one gas company formed by saints and another formed by sinners. The directors of the two companies will be more alike than the stockholders. The officers will be still more alike. And the men who come into contact with the legislature or the city council or the gas consumers, will not differ by a shade. The saintly stockholders not only do not know what is going on but so long as the dividends are comfortable they resent having inconvenient knowledge thrust upon them. Nevertheless, if the corporate owner is free from the weaknesses of the individual, it escapes also his wholesome limitations. It feels not the restraints that conscience and public sentiment lay on the businessman. It fears the laws no more, and public indignation far less than does the individual. You can hiss the bad man, egg him lampoon him, caricature him, ostracize him and his. Not so with the bad corporation. The corporation, moreover, is not in dread of hellfire. You cannot Christianize it. You may convert its stockholders, animate them with patriotism or public spirit or love of social service. But this will have little or no effect on the tenor of their corporation. In short, it is an entity that transmits the greed of investors, but not their conscience that returns them profits, but not unpopularity. Pages 105 at SEC, From Sin and Society, by Edward A. Ross, Professor of Sociology, University of Wisconsin, published by Houghton Mifflin and Company. 1907. Do you know of any corporations where the officers have much more freedom of action than is implied in the quotation? Do you think it is easier to Christianize proprietorships than corporations? Do the facts bear out your theory? Do you see any argument for unionism in the quotation? The important thing in life is our own attitude of mind, the tendency to accept or reject certain sorts of ideas, to make certain kinds of judgments. It is this attitude of mind which determines all our actions which, in turn, makes the quality of our lives, whether satisfactory or otherwise. This all-important attitude of mind is seldom acquired deliberately or changed quickly. It is formed and modified unconsciously and gradually by our intellectual activity, by the effort of the intelligence to grasp ideas corresponding to reality, and to relate them in the mind as the facts of reality are related in nature according to the natural and moral laws of the universe. If this is true, 
We have then a definite idea of education. It is the process or the experience of the conscious mind which has for its purpose the adjustment of ideas to reality for the sake of a better life. What method will be most effective in accomplishing this adjustment? Obviously one which will lead the person to examine his ideas. The ideas he actually works with and not those he holds merely for adornment or for keeping up appearances. The examination should be searching and critical. Preferably by comparing our own with quite different ideas of other people. Generalization is always a new influx of divinity into the mind. Every new step we take in thought reconciles 20 seemingly discordant facts. As expressions of one law, Emerson. Circles, life nowadays consists of adventures among generalizations, the significant moments in life. When first he faces certain broad ideas and broad facts, H.G. Wells in the research magnificent, knowledge is not sufficient. An encyclopedia is full of knowledge. Wisdom and mental efficiency are born from the mating of creative intelligence with knowledge. 